Now a hearing on the effect of home foreclosures and vacant homes on neighborhoods. Government reports show the number of vacant homes for sale are at record levels. This is about two and a half hours. The uh, Subcommittee on Domestic Policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform will now come to order. Today's hearing will explore the costs to neighborhoods caused by concentrations of vacant and abandoned houses, differences between strong housing markets and weaker ones, strategies to mitigate the effects of and prevent vacancies, and estimates of the size of the national problem. Without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. And without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. I would like to remind everyone that under a previous unanimous consent agreement, uh, Mr. Turner of Ohio is allowed to sit as a member of the sub subcommittee on issues related to state and local governments. As the uh, former mayor of Dayton, Ohio, we welcome him to these proceedings. And of course, the issue we're exploring today falls under the uh, categories uh, previously described. As chairman of the Federalism Subcommittee in the previous Congress, he has uh, great knowledge on these issues. and. I want to say that we welcome his presence here today, as do I welcome the uh, presence of uh, my colleague from California, uh, Ambassador Watson. Uh, thank you very much for being here. And I would uh, like to um, thank everyone for their attendance. The uh, Domestic Policy and sub, uh, Subcommittee of Government Reform has held three hearings on the effects of foreclosures since 2007. These include a six-hour, 15-witness marathon hearing in March 2007, as well as a field hearing in Cleveland, Ohio, one of the most foreclosure-devastated areas in the country. While awareness has grown that the meltdown of subprime lending has been a genuine tragedy for millions of individual borrowers and lenders, today's and tomorrow's hearings are about a largely unrecognized, deeply suffering, and totally blameless victim, neighborhoods. Some foreclosed properties find new buyers. Many do not. When foreclosure leads to vacant and abandoned houses surrounding neighborhoods and local municipalities suffer significant consequences. Those effects include falling property values of surrounding houses, loss of equity held by neighbors in these houses, loss of rental units for renters, loss of sales to neighborhood merchants, rises in, uh, increase in crime, rise in municipal costs in police, fire due to vandalism and arson, increased demolition and building inspection costs, increased legal expenses, increased demand on city social service programs, and a direct loss of property tax revenues. Academic researchers have found that the police costs for responding to criminal activity alone in vacant and abandoned houses adds up to between $5,000 and $6,000 per property. With demolition costs, the municipal cost per vacant property rises to $19,227. If the property is subject to arson, the cost rises to $34,199. The collective cost to neighbors within a 150-foot radius of a block in Chicago with a large concentration of vacant properties amounted to $220,000 in terms of capital depreciation of their own properties. To our knowledge, there's no comprehensive cost estimate for the nation, but it would surely have to be in the many billions. There are significant costs borne by people who had nothing to do with the transactions that resulted in the subprime mortgage meltdown. They weren't the lenders. They weren't the investors. They weren't the borrowers. They were simply the neighbors, renters, and taxpayers. This Congress has taken a significant step to help the neighbors deal with the problem they're now facing. Two weeks ago, the House passed H.R. 5818, the Neighborhood Stabilization Act of 2008. 
This bill creates a new federal program to address the effects on neighborhoods caused by the foreclosure crisis. The bill authorizes $15 billion in grants and loans to be spent by localities on a variety of strategies, including <coughs> vacant property acquisition, building rehabilitation, and demolition. The House agreed to an amendment that, which I had offered, clarifying that the purpose of the bill is to address the consequences for neighborhoods of a rise in the level of vacant and abandoned buildings and requiring local governments to target their spending accordingly. Unfortunately, the President issued a veto threat. I, I really can't understand this, but I hope that today and tomorrow's hearing might do something to change his mind. For if we can't help the totally innocent, the neighbors of these vacant properties, and they are the innocent victims of the foreclosure crisis, then whom should we help? Now, fortunately, we have some of the nation's leading experts with us today and tomorrow to help explain the problem neighborhoods, neighborhoods face and help guide a federal response. And when I speak of these issues, when I hear the witnesses, I just want to add a per, uh, personal note here. I started my career in the city of Cleveland over 41 years ago. I started at the local level, at the community level. I served in the Cleveland City Council many terms and served the city as mayor. I realize at a local level the kind of impact that this foreclosure crisis is having. When I was a councilman, if there was a single house in the ward that was abandoned, vacant, or boarded up, it was a cause to the whole community. Today, in some communities, there are hundreds and even maybe over a, th over a thousand. We're seeing, and, and just imagine, you're a senior citizen who's kept care, taking care of your property for your whole life, and, and the neighborhood around you, around you starts to change economically, but you still take care of your property. And then you get into the subprime situation. We have all these vacant properties all of a sudden. The equity that you have is your retirement security, and it's disappearing. This is a, a very serious matter that merits the attention of the Congress, which is why we're having this hearing now. But it also is uh, it's good to know that we have members of the House who are going to uh, be involved in this, uh, not just from Ohio and California, but from uh, New York and the Buffalo area with my colleague that just joined us, Congressman Higgins. So uh, does uh, the gentleman from Ohio, do you have an opening statement? Well, thank you. I recognize uh, Mr. Turner from Ohio. Thank you, Chairman Kucinich. I appreciate uh, you holding this hearing and you allowing me to participate. It's great to have two former Ohio mayors come together to look at the issue of um, what's happening in our neighborhoods uh, in Ohio. Uh, unfortunately, it is a, a very negative picture. Um, but I appreciate what you're doing to highlight this issue and uh, to look at solutions and what we can do. Uh, the home foreclosure crisis, once associated with just Ohio and Michigan, is now being felt across the rest of the country and is also rattling our international markets. As these hearings hopefully will demonstrate, problems associated with home foreclosures are felt by more than just the people whose homes are foreclosed. For the most part, individual foreclosures in and unto themselves are not a community-wide issue. It becomes an issue when a com community faces multiple home foreclosures in a concentrated area. Under this scenario, the problem, if left untreated, can turn once thriving neighborhoods into an area of blight. Statistics show that this problem is encompassing both our inner city neighborhoods and suburban neighborhoods alike. Fixing this problem won't be easy. Although increased home foreclosures are a national problem, a one-size-fits-all solution is not the answer. Addressing the foreclosure problem in Ohio will require a different solution than how we treat the same problem in perhaps another state. If we are truly to assist in resolving the foreclosure problem, then a federal solution must be well thought out with the formula that recognizes that affected, need, affected areas need more help, uh, some than others. Many communities faced with high foreclosure rates will have an easier time recovering. Uh, foreclosures in areas where real estate is considered a highly marketable will need very little federal assistance. On the contrary, those with multiple foreclosures uh, in difficulty in resale will see that uh, the process of foreclosure frequently leads to abandonment. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your efforts to highlight these problems associated with home foreclosures. I look forward to working with you 
And uh, I have to, to give one acknowledgement from my community as we go forward with this. Uh, when I served as mayor for the city of Dayton, uh, Commissioner Dean Lovelace on our commission brought forth the, the issue of predatory lending and sounded the alarm in our neighborhood of what was happening to families that were being subject to foreclosure with the prediction of, of what would happen in our neighborhoods and ultimately uh, the prediction of what would happen nationwide and as we've seen uh, failings in our financial markets. On July of 2001, he pushed forward a predatory lending ordinance which was intended to assist our community on both Ohio as a state and on the federal level. We were very slow to act and I think this is a, a real reason why we need to step forward in the many areas to provide assistance to both homeowners and to neighborhoods uh, to try to address some of the impacts of foreclosure and abandonment. And Mr. Chairman, I just thank you for bringing this forward and, and highlighting it so we can look at solutions and uh, real impacts in our neighborhoods. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. It's a pleasure to work with him on this. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Congresswoman Diane Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding today's very important hearing about the subprime mortgage crisis. The mortgage crisis affecting our nation is one of the most pressing domestic issues of the new millennium. In California, my home state, the number of homes that were lost to foreclosure during the first quarter of 2008 surged 327 percent from 2007 levels. In the terms of numbers, it means that there were 517 foreclosures every day for three months. If more is not done to restrain the trend of rising foreclosures, I believe Congress will find that neighborhoods would have significant increases in vacated or abandoned houses, neighborhoods would lose value, local governments would be overwhelmed with having to deal with increases in crime, social service programs would be in greater demand, which requires municipalities to spend to spend more, and losses in tax revenue from a declining property tax base would help lead to the decline in government infrastructure projects such as schools, roads, and public safety. Once the second quarter is finished and it is determined if the economy is in recession or not, Congress should determine immediately if the problem with the rise in foreclosures is limited to the subprime market or has the problem spilled into the mainstream home loan market. Hopefully that will not be the case. But if it is, we will find that more and more neighborhoods would be affected by concentration of abandoned and vacant houses, which is not in the best interest of our local communities or our nation as a whole. I look forward to hearing the testimony, Mr. Chairman, of our panelists today and working with my colleagues to help our nation recover from the foreclosure crisis. Thank you, and I yield back the remainder of my time. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, chair recognizes the uh, distinguished representative from the Buffalo area, Congressman Higgins. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, like you, uh, in representing uh, the City of Cleveland and the City Council. I represented the City of Buffalo in the uh, City Council as well. And uh, much like uh, a lot of areas of the uh, urban Northeast, uh, these areas were great economic centers uh, through most of the 20th century and over the past 30 years have declined significantly, losing population uh, not only to other areas of the country but also to the surrounding suburban areas. Uh, the urban cores of these cities were once great. They can be great again. But what fundamentally has to be addressed is the issue of vacant and abandoned housing. Uh, the city of Buffalo, in the city of Buffalo, it's a problem that's pervasive and growing. Uh, this administration has withdrawn from its commitment uh, to help urban areas and has an obligation uh, to retool its efforts uh, to ensure that cities like Cleveland, cities like Buffalo, and the great urban centers of the American Northeast are restored. And that starts and ends with a healthy, strong uh, urban environment. Fundamental to that is the housing stock. So I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, on this issue, and I applaud your leadership in that regard. I thank the gentleman. I uh, ask the witnesses to come forward, Mr. Kildee and Ms. Florine. Uh, while you're taking your seats, I'd like to uh, uh, 
let the members know and uh, those who are in our audience know uh, who is about to be testifying. Mr. Daniel Kildee is the uh, Kildee is the treasurer of Genesee County in Michigan. Mr. Kildee initiated the use of Michigan's new tax foreclosure law as a tool for community development and neighborhood stabilization. He founded the Genesee Land Bank, that was Michigan's first land bank, and now serves as its chairman and chief executive officer. Mr. Kildee is also president of the Genesee Institute, a research and training program focusing on urban land reform, smart growth, and land banking. And for those of you who are familiar with the name Kildee, uh, yes, uh, according to the information we have, uh, Mr. Kildee is the nephew of Congressman Dale Kildee, who is uh, one of the highly respected members of our United States Congress. We welcome you, Mr. Kildee. Uh, the next witness will be Ms. Nancy Florine. Uh, Ms. Florine is testifying on behalf of the National Association of Counties, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the National Community Development Association, and the National Association of Local Housing Finance Agency. Uh, Ms. Florine is a county council member in Montgomery County, Maryland. She serves as a member of the Council's Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee. Previously, she has served as the Commissioner of Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. She's a member of the Montgomery County Planning Board and a member of the Maryland Citizen Planners Association. I want uh, our witnesses to know, Mr. Kildee and Ms. Florine, that it is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Let the record reflect that the witnesses, uh, that each witness answered in the affirmative. I would ask uh, that each of the witnesses now give a brief summary of your testimony. Keep this summary under five minutes in duration. Keep in mind that your entire statement will be in the record of this hearing and will be available to all uh, the members, not only of this committee, but in Congress. Uh, Mr. Kildee, you're going to be our first witness. I want to thank you, and I would ask that you proceed with your statement. Is this on? There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for, for your leadership on this issue. You and other members of the committee obviously have helped to bring this this entire issue to the national stage and for those of us that are working in places like Flint and Dayton and Buffalo and other communities across the country that have experienced significant population loss and decline, we, we, we appreciate it. In fact, many of us have been working on this issue for quite some time. It's only recently that this mortgage crisis has brought the issue of vacant and abandoned properties to a higher uh, level of consciousness. So it's, it's first of all my hope that the current conversation taking place surrounding uh, the mortgage crisis will lead to more fundamental uh, reforms that value, uh, that place a higher value on the urban landscape uh, generally. Uh, I'm from Flint, Michigan. Uh, and as, you know, as the chairman said, uh, the, the home of myself and, and uh, my congressman, uh, Dale Kildee. Uh, Flint is the birthplace of General Motors. We once had 79,000 people working for the same company in our city. We had a population in 1960 of 197,000. Today it's about 115,000 people. And so while we have a lot of anxiety about the five or 6,000 mortgage foreclosures that are pending in our own community right now, we've been dealing with vacant and abandoned property for quite some time. When we lost 40 percent of our population over 30 years, those people who left did not take their houses with them. And they left behind a landscape that is seriously deteriorated. The cost of that abandonment is what concerns us. Uh, Seventy percent of the fires that take place in Flint, Michigan, take place in an abandoned house. So our, our fire department in the city of Flint has to be three or four times what it would be if that fuel were not out there in the neighborhoods. This year, um, we have seen an increase in tax delinquency. All of this mortgage meltdown is resulting in higher rates of, of tax delinquency as well. 
Two years ago, I had $29 million of delinquent taxes in the county. Last year, it was $37 million of delinquent taxes. And this year, there are $49 million in unpaid taxes in Genesee County. All of it being exacerbated by the fact that literally thousands of properties held uh, by uh, lenders or servicers are not paying their taxes. In my community, about five or six years ago, we began the process of getting our arms around this problem by creating a land bank authority and reforming our tax foreclosure procedures. We eliminated the somewhat antiquated procedure of selling tax liens to private investors because we saw with tax foreclosure how negative the liquidation model had become for the urban landscape. That old tax lien system is a lot like how mortgage lenders are now disposing of mortgage foreclosed assets. We reformed our process. We now, as the county treasurer, get control of these properties and dispose of them in a way through our land bank authority that considers the long-term interests of the neighborhoods, of the urban landscape, of the private equity that's already in place. Our fear, of course, is that while we have made great progress in Flint in getting our arms around the problems associated with that first wave of abandonment, for example, we've taken title to 7,400 properties in the last six years into our land bank authority, 12% of the parcels of land in the city of Flint. Our fear is that while we've done all this work to reform our state and local systems to deal with abandonment, this next wave of property is sitting out there heading our way. The cost is enormous. The cost to local government with the reduction of the tax base and the uncollected taxes that, we, that we're unable to use to ba provide basic services occurs at the same time that the conditions in these neighborhoods increase the demand for government services. Our water and sewer systems are, are built for a population of 250,000. We've got 150,000 users paying to maintain that system. The stress on local government is enormous, and the loss of private equity, uh, those, those homeowners in those neighborhoods, as the chairman said, who pay their mortgage, they pay their taxes, and they're having the equity that they've invested in that home robbed from them uh, for something that they, quite honestly, had nothing uh, to do with. This is a problem, interesting now, that places like Flint and Dayton and Buffalo and others, Cleveland for sure, that have been associated with the problem of vacant and abandoned property Historically, this is a problem now being experienced in all sorts of cities. The concern that I have as the federal response is being developed is that there be some recognition that the older, particularly older industrial cities that have been dealing with abandonment for quite some time do not have the strength in the real estate market to absorb five, in our case, five, six, seven thousand new abandonments. I mean, every community that's dealing with mortgage foreclosures obviously are going to have a difficult time. The problems in a place like Flint, where we already have an oversupply in a very weak demand market of a low value housing commodity, the problems associated with 5,000 new abandonments or 5,000 distressed sales coming into our marketplace are frightening. Uh, what, we, what we have to avoid, I think, in our community and as a nation is a situation that could lead to mortgage lenders and servicers essentially privatizing the profit by liquidating the properties that have value and socializing the loss by passing them on to us. I just foreclosed on March 31st through the tax foreclosure system on 1,194 properties, over 300 of them had mortgages on them, and they're upside down in value. Those lenders have passed that problem on to us. We're willing to accept it, but we'd like to accept it with the ability to also go to those same servicers and lenders and say, you know, there are other assets that you own in our community, and we'd like to talk to you about them as well. This is a problem that obviously I care deeply about. It's a problem that's, that's uh, affecting Flint, Michigan, and my own neighborhood.
and it's one that I look forward to, uh, to providing you assistance with as you deliberate on this very important subject. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for his uh, very fluid and comprehensive statement about the underlying economic crises that is occurring in urban communities and in cities, and of course in your own county of Genesee, with respect to the concomitant effects of the subprime mortgage um, fiasco. I look forward to the testimony of the next witness, uh, Ms. Florine. I would ask that you proceed, and uh, please keep your statement to five minutes or less. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today to address the impact of the mortgage crisis on neighborhoods. It's a special honor for me uh, to be with um, uh, former uh, local le elected officials who've been elevated to this position, uh, because as you know, at the local level, that is where the rubber hits the road. Local officials across the country are pleased that the House of Representatives recently passed the Neighborhood Stabilization Act of 2008, uh, providing $15 billion in urgently needed loans and grants to help cities, urban counties, and states deal with the foreclosure crisis that's overtaking the nation. Um, this really does recognize the severity of the problem nationally. Uh, cities and counties would be able to use this funding for the purchase and rehab of vacant and foreclosed homes. It would help stabilize communities by reselling the homes for occupancy as soon as possible. Uh, we really need this legislation to address the crisis. Uh, you've heard from Mr. Kildee, certainly the chairman's comments at the beginning. Uh, there's very little to add. Uh, but across the United States, this, this problem threatens the billions of federal dollars invested in neighborhood revitalization over the years. It is a fact that foreclosed homes drive down the value of surrounding properties, and the sooner that we solve this problem, the less collateral damage we'll have with depreciating home values. This cuts directly to what's the mainstay of local governor, government revenues, property taxes. We cannot adequately fund schools and other essential public services if we have a prolonged decline in property values. Some estimates have put the number of foreclosed properties at 600,000 or more, and the problem is simply too great for counties and cities to tackle on their own due to their own declining tax bases. Even in Montgomery County, Maryland, right up the road, we've not been immune to the housing crisis. Uh, notice of foreclosure sales in my county have increased from 68 during the first quarter of 2007 to 918 during the first quarter of 2008, an increase of 1,250%. Uh, nothing like Mr. Kildee's numbers, but nonetheless for us, this is huge. A total of 611 notices of for mortgage loan default were issued in our, the first quarter, compared with 103 in the first quarter of 2007, an increase of nearly 500%. We're trying to deal with this uh, by participating in the Maryland HOPE hotline for residents facing foreclosure. We've been offering home ownership and foreclosure solution sessions across the county. We partnered with the state to provide assistance to residents and contributing money to nonprofits to provide counseling to homeowners. But we're also using our own money. A matching state contribution to develop a credit enhancement program to encourage local banks to refin refinance loans for individuals subject to foreclosure who might require special underwriting criteria. Uh, but like many er local areas across the country, uh, we're grappling with budget shortfalls. When a local government is faced with declining revenues, it's basically two choices, increase tax rates or make cuts in services. As many of your staff will tell you, uh, Montgomery County is looking at the increasing the taxes approach right now. Uh, and I'm very concerned about how much farther we can go to provide the services our residents uh, need and deserve. Um, the neighborhoods are indeed innocent bystanders in the subprime mortgage chaos. It'll take more than a local or state remedy to curb the decline. The funding provided by H.R. 5818 is timely, targeted, and temporary. We'll work closely with members of the conference committee as they reconcile the House and Senate bills. The Senate version provides an emergency appropriation of $4 billion in community development block grant funds to be allocated based on a formula to be developed within 60 days of enactment. 
We'll be urging the conferees to, one, utilize the CDBG program as the program to deliver assistance, as in the Senate bill, with 70 percent of the funds to entitlement cities and urban counties. CDBG grantees are intimately familiar with that program. The funds made available under the bill are for the very types of activities that they carry out on a regular basis. Number two, we'll work with you to provide that funding for foreclosure relief and mitigation be in the form of grants for ease of administration. Three, we'll work with you to permit that the funds to be used to assist families with earnings up to 140 percent of median income, with 25 percent of the funds to be used by households at 50 percent of median. We'll work with you to permit 5 percent of the funds to be used for administrative costs. This is consistent with CDBG funding made available to respond to Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Thank you very much for your favorable consideration of our views. I thank the gentlelady for her testimony. Uh, I'd like to begin with asking Treasurer Kildee some questions. Uh, in some ways, you might be the ideal witness to answer um, this question. You know, can you tell the committee what lessons may be drawn from the Genesee County's experience with both a vacant and abandoned housing problem and a non-interventionist federal government? The most significant lesson that we have learned is that economics really do matter when it comes to urban land. And we cannot allow the governmental systems that are in place to treat property that has significant value with a different set of rules than we treat property that, has, that is essentially upside down in value. The Genesee County Land Bank and our Michigan Land Bank Act, along with our tax foreclosure uh, uh, reforms, address that issue by not allowing the speculator market to pick and choose and essentially disaggregate the inventory that is the subject of our concern. In our case, initially, it was tax foreclosed properties. There are valuable properties that get lost through foreclosure. That's why people make those odd infomercials. No, the no. idea would be, though, to, to not allow the lenders to do the very same thing. To no, you've, you've ident you have a database where you can literally see who got into the subprimes, who's come out in the secondary market here, who the speculators are, is that right? Right. And the issue, of course, for us is, is we want to approach with the support of the federal government with some strength those lenders and say to them, deal with us with your entire inventory. Don't, uh, don't allow the system in place to allow you to essentially liquidate the value that's in those properties for which there may be a speculator market. What, what, kind, of, what kind of federal aid uh, or uh, federal assistance or tools would be required by local jurisdiction to strengthen their position vis-a-vis -vis the speculators, the, uh, the banks that are involved in these subprimes? Number one would be to have an efficient public entity that can acquire and then manage and dispose the properties. That's critical. Secondly would be to target the federal support and other available support for acquisition of these properties in a fashion that does allow us to approach the lenders with the opportunity, if you want to call it that, for us to acquire their entire inventory within our community. I, I think to do this on a regional basis, and that's where I think the counties do play an important role, takes advantage of the more diverse real estate market within the region and so that a city does not have to essentially get stuck with right. those properties that are, that are underwater in value and not be able to take advantage of whatever retained equity may be out there on those foreclosed assets that are in markets that might be more functional. By, by stepping forward the way that you do, uh, do you think you can, that you do a better job than traditionally private sector real estate tasks than, uh, in, that you can do a better job than yeah. what the private sector is doing? I think so, but I, 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 would, I would say which private sector, because there's all sorts of markets for land. And what I am concerned about is that the for-profit investor market that really will put property into its best and most productive use is the for-profit market that I want to talk to. The problem is the systems that we had in place for tax foreclosure and the worry that I have about mortgage foreclosed assets is that we're not talking 
about a system that delivers these properties to that investor market, but to the speculative market, to right. the property flippers. So with the land bank, uh, you have one paradigm. Let's say you don't have a land bank. Can jurisdictions without land banks adequately address significant numbers of vacant properties? How do they do it? Well, I think it, it's up to the to, to the capacity of the local government or even to the nonprofit sector in a particular community. I'm an advocate of public land bank authorities because I think it creates the permanent capacity in a single purpose entity whose job it is to deal with underutilized, vacant and abandoned property. It's too easy an issue for somebody to avoid in, unless you have an entity specifically designed for that purpose. Council Member, thank you. Council Member Florine, as you know, Congress passed a bill to help neighborhoods in need. The bill has a veto threat against it. Well, I'd like to be optimistic about the bill's future. Will you tell the committee what happens to neighborhoods if the bill is not enacted and if the market alone, the market alone, is relied upon to deal with the growing problem of vacant and abandoned properties? Uh, well, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, it's very evident uh, that we have left it to the market. That what? And we have left it to the market already, and we're seeing the, the effects of that. Uh, there is no Could question. Could you elaborate? Well, the market that, that this has been left to is a market that is ma many cases has preyed upon people who cannot afford uh, the situations in which they've been led, uh, has particular impact on uh, minority communities. In Maryland, African American homeowners are three times more likely than whites uh, to receive a subprime loan and four times more likely to re refinance from a subprime lender. Latinos are twice as likely as whites to receive a subprime loan and three times more likely to re refinance from a subprime lender. And those are, those are communities of interest that are uh, particularly hit her hard by this. Um, there is no question that uh, decisions have been made, uh, structures have been created uh, that have led people into a situation which we are collectively uh, faced with having to uh, redefine and solve for the benefit of the communities around those homes. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Turner for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank both of you for what you're doing on a local level, what you're doing in taking some of the best practices and describing it to others, and, and highlight, uh, highlighting some of the issues uh, that you see that, that need to be resolved. And, and one of the ones that, that I heard from you as you're, you're talking that I, I think is that, um, that bears some additional discussion is the issue of when a property becomes a target for foreclosure and that process of foreclosure um, and oftentimes uh, the resulting process of, of uh, title problems that ensue and then the attempt to return that property uh, back to, to productive use. When I served as mayor of Dayton before even the, the foreclosure crisis occurred, when we would have abandoned properties in neighborhoods, um, I, I would have people tell, ask me, you know, what is, the, what is the biggest problem that you have with abandoned properties? And the, the answer sounded uh, boring and esoteric, but it's the truth and it's title. Um, tomorrow, someone could not just go grab that property and fix it up and put it back to productive use. They were usually highly complex title issues and problems as a result of the financial transactions that resulted in the property being abandoned and, and in foreclosure. And now that we're seeing this massive foreclosure um, uh, uh, incident, uh, it's just compounding itself. And as you mentioned, Mr. Kildee, a lot of these properties being upside down where the lien values are greater than the property value itself. Um, it, uh, it causes even greater concern. I saw there were many properties in, in our community that when they were going in the process of foreclosure, sometimes even the family has left, <clears throat> perhaps even it's gone to sheriff sale and no one has purchased it, perhaps it's gone to sheriff sale and the bank itself has purchased it. But the lack of attention by the lender to the property or maintaining the value of the property had a huge negative impact on the neighborhood and really the future success of that, that property. Uh, the lender's obligation, largely contractual to the individual that they, they had the loan. They would have either um, lower or increased um, liability to the lender based upon the lender having preserved the asset. But beyond that, there was no obligation other than just housing code and, and normal um, uh, issues of, um, of condemnation if it became a threat. Um, Mr. Kildee, you mentioned the issue of federal funding that can assist in, in that process, but I, I'd like your, 
your additional thoughts on if there, there are things that we should be doing. You know, obviously the, the mortgage industry, highly regulated industry, um, the foreclosure process is really a government-run process in order to sustain um, the, the financial transactions. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, what you see of the failure of lenders to, to step to the plate and uh, some of the things that you might know of that communities are doing that makes a difference? Well, lenders secure their financial interest in a property with a mortgage, which from our point of view and the way we modeled the, or created the Michigan law is that that mortgage interest is an ownership interest and the rights of ownership come with significant responsibility. I think you'll probably hear some thoughts from, uh, from some of the uh, subsequent panel members, uh, certainly Alan Malik from the National Housing Institute, we were just talking about this subject, that we do need a system that recognizes that if a lender intends to secure its financial interest in property with an ownership interest, with that ownership interest comes the responsibility of being a property owner. That means that building code violations should be the responsibility of that property owner. And I know we've seen Certainly in Cleveland with the great work that Judge Pianca has done and, and certainly in New York other housing court judges that have been willing to hold lenders responsible for that ownership interest. To me, that's critical. Second, the point that you made initially on title, it's very important to create local authority to clarify title. And this is one of the, another, I don't, I'm a, sort of a one note Johnny on land banks, but it's one of the things that land banks can do. The Michigan Land Bank Act allows us to expedite a quiet title procedure on any property that we have interest in, in 90 days. So number one, identifying those owners of interest, holding them responsible as owners, and then secondly, being able to take their interest away from them if they choose not to be responsible property owners, whether it's a mortgage lender or the actual occupant of the property, the same standard ought to apply. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I, I think one thing to recall as well is when you have an abandoned property with code enforcement issues because it's, it's been left alone, even uh, as the chain of title and, and or just a sale is being addressed, it sends a message. It sends a message to every other property in that community. It sends, sends a message to the community um, that, well, you don't need to try. If you're on the edge, why not do it too? And, and why should we clean up that graffiti? And why should you cut your grass? And why should you fix those root, uh, broken steps? And why should you respect uh, your neighbor's need for no, no, noise control or quiet? All the kinds of things, as you know, uh, that make a huge difference in the quality of life within a community. Um, uh, why should children uh, I'd listen to the parents. I don't mean to overextend the analogy, but the fact remains that it sends a message to the whole community that we don't matter, that my community doesn't matter. And, and that is a very difficult thing to turn around. Um, as I said in my testimony, billions of dollars have been, of federal dollars have been spent on neighborhood revitalization to combat that very issue. And this just starts it all over again. I thank the gentleman. I want to note that uh, we've been joined by a congressman from Massachusetts who represents the city of Lynn, among other areas, Congressman Tierney. After uh, uh, Congresswoman Watson has a chance to answer questions, we'll uh, go to you and then Mr. Higgins, if that would please the committee. Yes. Uh, Congresswoman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this goes to the Honorable uh, Nancy Florine. Uh, in your town, in the communities, what happens at the point of contact with the consumer and the bank? I, I'm wondering how do these people get these subprime loans when they might make $1,500 a month and the loan is for a property that costs mm -hmm. 175000 What happens at that point? Uh, well, the, the issue of predatory lending is one that we've been struggling with in Maryland for quite some time. As, yeah. And as you know, um, there is a trade-off between uh, the issue of access to credit fairly and um, in a proper way, and access to credit that's designed to benefit the lender, or in many cases the broker, uh, and does not achieve uh, a desired social good and puts the, the lender in a position, uh, the, the per 
purchaser in a position that they can really never dig their way out of. Uh, many of these thing, issues are cultural. Uh, many of uh, the brokers are not regulated in the way that they should be. Um, and the, the big issue, as I uh, think m most people know, is the fact that there's no local um, bank financial institution interest in the property because of the way that these mortgages get bundled and sold and, and who knows if uh, people from Saudi Arabia end up holding the, holding the, the credit. It is a, an international market uh, for items that used to be um, a local service and uh, the local banks well, that would serve these folks. You, you led right in to my next question <laughs> and I wanted to know and then also Mr. Kildee who, uh, whose uncle is usually my seatmate on the floor, a person I really <laughs> respect. But uh, the two of you, have you seen an influx of foreign investment into the housing market? And if you have, how significant has that investment been? Do you know? Either one. I have not. I mean, I, I'm in a community where there's disinvestment. We don't have significant investment. What I have seen is is something perhaps not quite as, as um, insidious as foreign investment, but it's out-of-town investors. And honestly, other than Ohio, California, Massachusetts, and New York, we don't really want anybody investing in our properties. <laughs> I don't miss California. anybody. <laughs> right. the, the issue for us has been this, this liquidation model that has applied to, previously to tax foreclosures and now is being applied to mortgage foreclosures, where the properties themselves are not treated as part of somebody's landscape, but they're treated as security on mm -hmm. some yeah some uh, uh, security that is bought and sold. Uh, and, and so it, the, the concept behind this sort of liquidation approach that we're very worried about ignores the fact that the underlying asset sits next to some family and is a part of the fabric of a community. And, and that is, that's problematic. And that's why the notion of having local authorities making decisions about the actual disposition of the property that consider the interest of the residents of the local community and the market conditions are, I think, is a better approach. I'm getting ready to hold a huge forum on this issue. And uh, we have bankers and we have uh, all aspects of the consumer market and, uh, as I said, the housing market. And uh, I'm trying to get my staff to build it up so we can get a thousand people there because this has been the number one concern in areas of my district. And I see the prey is on the lower socioeconomic areas and seniors. And people are losing their homes and calling my office, what can I do? So we want to get the information out there from the uh, experts. And uh, we do have a set of bills going through that might address, but probably we need to do more overseeing of the regulators. But that's why I ask you, uh, Madam Councilwoman, what happens at that point of contact where a person will sign on that line and uh, they have those balloon payments, you know, and they just can't handle them and there we are, foreclosed. If I might um, observe as well, um, Congresswoman Watson, um, consumer co counseling is uh, is going to have to be uh, uh, the area where we devote tremendous attention to, and in uh, uh, ma many languages, uh, and uh, forcing people uh, really to to read the materials that they're provided, and to be able to make the right uh, financial decisions and understand uh, the fiscal issues that they are uh, getting themselves into. Uh, just uh, another comment, Mr. Chairman, but uh, in California we have an uh, Office of Consumer Affairs and I'm thinking now about uh, getting someone within my legislature to put in a bill that would require a division that will deal with property ownership uh, yes. and so on uh, under the Department of Consumer Affairs and we need that intermediate group where people can be educated before they sign on that line. 
So Definitely. thinking that through, I think we'll have something that we can present. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, you, and I'd like to have an ongoing discussion with the general lady about that. I think yeah. that we, we need to look for more solutions on dealing with it at a local level. Chair recognizes uh, Congressman Tierney from Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both for being here today. I think you gave a, a very good picture of what's going on out there. Uh, Mr. Kildy, I, don't, I, I probably don't have to, but I want to add my voice to the chorus of people to tell you how much your uncle is respected and relied upon in this institution for his knowledge and his, uh, his work effort. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to serve with him. The legislation that we were talking about um, that may be vetoed, uh, in a nutshell, talks about voluntarily writing down the value of the, of the property and the mortgage on it in return for a guaranteed value of the security on that. What is your opinion in your respective communities about whether or not uh, lenders will, in fact, voluntarily participate in that program as opposed to needing the uh, probably uh, the stick of sorts of letting a bankruptcy judge have the same authority if they don't voluntarily participate? Well, that's really the question that I think we're all trying to get our arms around. If there is some way, and this is obviously the legitimate role for a federal, uh, for federal intervention, for us as the community, and I speak for people in Flint, and I speak for my land bank authority, if we can get these properties uh, without having to, uh, to purchase them at a price that essentially renders them uh, useless to us. We, we want to get control of these properties. We have the capacity to manage them, but we can't take them by purchasing them for whatever the, um, whatever the balance might be on a particular uh, mortgage. Because in almost all the cases, the properties with significant value have mortgage bal balances well above what our market will bear. So you, obviously you put your finger on the problem. If there is, if there is, uh, do you have a feel for your community banking establishment, your lenders out that way, as to whether or not they would voluntarily participate? Lo or local lenders, local lenders for sure. And in the case, for example, of uh, of Fannie Mae, mm -hmm. uh, I happen to chair the State Land Bank Authority, and I purchased 184 mortgage foreclosed properties from Fannie Mae by proposing to them that we buy them for $175 each and competed against, I'm sure, what were more significant cash bids, we were able to secure those properties because we have something that other purchasers don't have, the ability to manage that, that real estate and to do it in a way that reduces the likelihood that more property in the surrounding landscape is going to see its values fall. Any any company that's going to be in business for more than the next 12 months better be thinking about how the disposition of their current assets is going to affect the remaining assets against which they have mortgages. And if they fail to do that, they do so at their own peril. So thinking about these properties themselves as being the only properties that matter and the, the cash return that they might receive on those properties being the only number they need to be concerned with is a, is a foolish penny-wise but pound-foolish approach. And, and uh, that's what we're seeing some of them do. In the case of Fannie Mae, they saw the light and, and were willing to work with us. Thank you. Um, Congressman, I think uh, from the banking perspective, of course the bankers can tell you, but I think it would be my um, expectation that what I'm told regularly is it's about uh, time and it's about predictability. About time and what else? The time uh, in which uh, property is not generating revenue for them and uh, the predictability of the process. And if there are clear guidelines, uh, clear direction, and the ability to move properties, which is what we all want. We want those properties back occupied by families, mm -hmm. contributing to the community in the speediest time available. Um, if that, that benefits all players. Well, thank you both. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I want to uh, thank the gentleman from Massachusetts and uh, thank the panelists. Uh, the subcommittee will be in contact with you and one of the things that we're going to be looking at is to try to quantify the um, transfer of wealth right. that's occurring here because it, it, it's the, re, the really under, the underlying question and to members of the subcommittee uh, to uh, my colleague, Ms. Watson, Mr. Tierney, Mr. Cummings. The underlying question that we're moving towards here 
is that there has been a massive transfer of wealth upwards into the hands of a few, taking money you know, away from people with the greatest investments in their home, taking money away from communities. And in some of your remarks, Mr. Kildee, you got into that. I want to thank this. You know, we're going to be looking at that further because this is, you know, bottom line, rock bottom issue here, mm -hmm. this transfer of wealth that's going on. It's extraordinary. Thank you. Uh, we will be in touch with you, uh, Mr. Kildee, Ms. Florine, thank you. for your testimony, for your willingness to answer questions. We're going to move on to the next panel. Thank you. And uh, as we're moving on to the next panel, I want to say how pleased we are to be joined by the Congressman from Maryland, and particularly Baltimore, Congressman Elijah Cummings, who has been uh, a critical part of the work of this subcommittee in looking at all issues that relate to the economy of cities and to the issues that uh, relate to making sure that government is truly functioning for people in the inner city. So, Mr. Cummings, thank you for joining us. And uh, we're now uh, going to move to the next panel. Uh, we're fortunate to have outstanding witnesses on our second panel. I would ask that you uh, be seated. Uh, we have Ms. Vicki Bean, who is a professor of law and public policy at New York University School of Law. She's also, also the director of the Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy. Her areas of research include affordable housing, land use, and predatory lending. Ms. Bean's research has been published in numerous journals, including a 2004 article in Cityscape entitled Impact Fees and Housing Affordability. Next, Dr. Phyllis. Bets. We have. Oh, uh, he moves. <laughs> you're not Dr. Betts. Okay. Is Dr. Betts here? Okay. As Dr. Betts is uh, moving to her position at the witness table, Dr. Betts is the director of the Center for Community Building and Neighborhood Action at the University of Memphis. She's over 10 years of experience working with community development organizations and agencies. Her work revolves around sustaining neighborhood housing markets and enhancing quality of life in low to moderate income neighborhoods. Uh, Mr. John Talmadge. Mr. Talmadge is the president and CEO of Social Impact, Inc. Under his leadership, uh, that Social Compact, Inc. Under his leadership, Social Compact performs market research and analysis of inner city neighborhoods throughout the country. The goal of this effort is to generate new tools and practices that will contribute to innovation in the field of community development. Prior to joining Social Compact, Mr. Talmadge served as the Deputy Director for Economic Development for the City of New Orleans, where the focus of his work was business development. I want to thank the witnesses for appearing before the uh, subcommittee today. I would ask that you, um, uh, just to let you know it's our policy to swear in witnesses, I would ask that you stand, raise your right hand. You uh, solemnly swear or affirm the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I didn't do that. Let the record reflect that the, each witness answered in the affirmative. Uh, and I would uh, ask that, as in the previous panel, each witness give a statement uh, five minutes or less in duration. Your entire statement will be included in the record of the hearing. I'm uh, grateful for your presence here, and I would ask that. Uh, uh, we begin with uh, Ms. Bean. Please proceed. Thank you, Chairman Kucinich and all the members of the subcommittee. I'm honored to be here today uh, to share with you findings from the Furman Center's research on the external effects of mortgage foreclosures and vacant properties. Few urban problems have been more vexing or more threatening than the huge number of mortgage foreclosures plaguing our communities. To understand better how and whether the government should intervene in this crisis, the Furman Center has undertaken several studies to examine the external costs that foreclosures impose. Foreclosures obviously harm the homeowners who are threatened with losing their homes, as well as their creditors. But if foreclosures also harm third parties, such as neighbors, the broader community, and the renters of the properties that are in foreclosure, the justification for government intervention in the crisis becomes all the more compelling. To assess the external effects foreclosures have on neighbors and the broader community, we examined the impact that the filing of a foreclosure notice has on the sales prices of nearby properties. And to assess the harms foreclosures might impose on renters in buildings going into foreclosure, we examined the characteristics of the buildings that were entering foreclosure in 2007 in New York City 
and estimated how many of those buildings house tenants who would be dislocated by the, for by the foreclosure. I will briefly describe our findings on each of those issues. Our research shows that foreclosures depress the sales prices of nearby properties. Properties near homes and buildings that have entered the foreclosure process on average sell at lower prices than comparable properties in the same neighborhoods that are not near homes in foreclosures. Foreclosures in New York City are highly concentrated in specific neighborhoods. In order to assess the effects that foreclosures had on the neighboring properties, we separated New York City's neighborhoods into two groups, high exposure neighborhoods in which the median property sold was near uh, 15 properties that were in the foreclosure process versus low exposure uh, neighborhoods in which the median home sale was near only one property. In the low exposure neighborhoods, the sales prices of homes within 500 feet of just one or two properties for which a foreclosure notice had been filed in the prior 24 months was almost 2% lower than the prices of similar properties in the same neighborhood but not near a foreclosure. Sales prices of homes within 500 feet of, or of three to five properties that were in foreclosure were almost 3% lower than the prices of comparable properties that were not near uh, a foreclosure. In the high exposure neighborhoods, properties again sold for less than comparable properties in the same neighborhood but near fewer uh, uh, recent foreclosures. The discount was higher for properties near larger numbers of foreclosures. Our work accordingly provides strong evidence that neighbors bear significant costs when a homeowner loses his or her property to foreclosure. Local governments, in turn, lose tax revenues. Efforts to help stem the tide of foreclosures and to assist local governments in putting those foreclosed properties back into the hands of responsible families accordingly may be justified by the external effects that foreclosures have on property values. Our research also documents that foreclosures have an impact on another group of collateral victims. Our data on notices of foreclosure filed in 2007 in New York City reveals that 60% of the properties going into foreclosure in 2007 were two to four family buildings or multifamily buildings. A conservative estimate is that those buildings house at least 15,000 renter households. If those properties are sold at auction, those households will face eviction and will bear the costs and dislocation of finding a new home. New York City isn't exceptional in this regard. Other researchers have also documented that multifamily buildings make up a significant portion of the foreclosures throughout the Northeast. Our results show that foreclosures not only harm the homeowners and creditors involved, but also hurt neighboring properties the community itself, and the tenants in those buildings. Whatever the outcome of the debate over the desirability of assisting homeowners facing foreclosure, or their creditors, therefore, there is justification for intervening in the foreclosure crisis to protect those third party who our results reveal are bearing a significant part of the cost of foreclosure. Thank you. Thank you for that very significant quantification. Appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Betts, please proceed. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, could you get a little bit closer to that mic? Oh, you know what you mean. And uh, staff, could you make sure that mic's on? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm coming from Memphis, Tennessee. We're not New York City. We're not Southern California, Buffalo, Cleveland, or Baltimore. To begin my message, I want to say that all of our markets are different. House Bill 5818 is a good bill because it allows for that flexibility. It may not be veto proof. If it's not, we need something similar. And I want to share with you a little bit of our data from Memphis to underscore the need for flexibility and also for a funding formula that takes into account the flexibility uh, from market to market. I'll speak to two points. Everyone is underscored and I think knows in their gut uh, that 
the impact of foreclosures on neighborhoods is debilitating. I'm going to show some examples. Secondly, the data that we use to underscore a funding formula in terms of what will go to states and how states will distribute money within the states needs to be equitable in terms of regions of the country, different kinds of cities, different kinds of housing markets. And I want to say just a couple of words about the apparent database of choice, uh, First American, and I think that my colleague, Mr. Talmadge, will follow up on that. The debilitating impact of foreclosure to point one. We're one of those areas of the country that didn't just get hit. Our foreclosure rate has been going up slowly uh, since 2000. Uh, in 2007, we had almost 12,000 foreclosure notifications for a total in that eight-year period of over 61,000 foreclosure notifications. Uh, this is the equivalent of 25 percent of our single housing stock, our single family housing stock, and that's where we're hardest hit. Uh, we don't well, what, have. Excuse me, what was that percent again? 25 percent of our single family housing stock. Thank you. Our subprime lending escalated between 2004 and 2005, going up from 25 percent to 40 percent of all mortgage loans in Shelby County, and that includes our suburban area. And clearly, we're tracking subprime and foreclosures, and the neighborhoods that are hardest hit are hit both by subprime lending uh, and by foreclosures. Our hardest hit areas actually are those areas that we would call middle class neighborhoods. Middle class neighborhoods with modest priced housing where people moving from lower income neighborhoods are looking for a higher quality of life. These are the neighborhoods that are most heavily impacted that are going to have the greatest impact on our tax base in Memphis and Shelby County and where this kind of intervention can make a difference. If we take a triage approach, this kind of bill can make a big difference in Memphis neighborhoods. I'd like to put up map two, please, which is the other map. The one on the bottom. And if you could zoom in. This is Memphis and Shelby County. I'm sometimes asked from folks in the Northeast if that's the Mississippi River, and so I'm going to say yes, that is, on the left of the map. Uh, our downtown and center city area is right there on the river, and then radiating north from the river is North Memphis, south is South Memphis. Those are our traditional low-income areas. Most of our foreclosure there is driven by high-cost refinance loans, oftentimes second-generation folks who are taking out equity uh, when parents die. And that's a different kind of situation that will require a different kind of remedy than what we're seeing in what we call the areas of the horseshoe. You can see the darker the teal is where our greater number of foreclosures are. And in the north arc and the south arc in that horseshoe, Foreclosure driven by subprime lending, which we can document, um, is moving out to our suburban area, in fact. If you see the lighter teal color, that's a suburban area. That's a different animal, but it's foreclosure nonetheless and requires the kind of intervention that you're talking about. We're doing a neighborhood by neighborhood survey and problem property audit, and that will be the next map. We are looking at the conditions of foreclosed properties and all of the other properties in the neighborhood for comparison purposes. And it's become quite clear that foreclosures are driving blight in these middle class. And by middle class, we're talking about $120,000 houses, which are actually quite nice in Memphis. So, you know, this, this is a different market. Uh, and if these markets go, then so go Memphis and Shelby County. Uh, this is Mendenhall Estates. Uh, in Mendenhall Estates, in 2007, the red parcels are the foreclosed parcels in Mendenhall Estates. 1,000 parcels, all single family in this particular neighborhood. 65 foreclosed parcels, 6.5% of the single family housing stock. 15% of them were vacant when we surveyed them in the last month. And in the neighborhood as a whole, 
the other uh, cross-hatched parcels are showing signs of neglect. When we drilled down to look at other vacant properties in this neighborhood, we found for the 22 that we looked at that were in the worst shape, they were virtually all foreclosures from 2005 and 2006. Some of them had moved into the investor market. Uh, others had been vacant the whole time. Neighborhood stabilization, a public problem, foreclosure mitigation, a private trouble. If the two are combined, uh, we can begin to move forward. Just a final note on the um, First American CoreLogic database. Uh, when we have compared what's in that database, uh, which according to its own documentation covers about 50 percent of the subprime mortgages nationally, when we've compared the number of mortgages by zip code from that database with the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act subprime mortgages, we're finding that in these heavily hit neighborhoods, only about 25 percent of the mortgages seem to be in the First American database. Our theory on that is that uh, these are modest mortgages, modest neighborhoods, and they don't appeal as much to investors uh, in terms of some of these securities instruments. Um, John will be looking at that. And if there's a difference of, say, 5, 7, 10 percent, if we compare Memphis and Tennessee, uh, to California or New, New York City, that's going to result in a, in a major flaw in the funding formula. Uh, we want to have to deal with that flaw. That is, we want this bill, <laughs> we want this bill uh, to be implemented. Um, in conclusion, um, thanks for the opportunity to contribute to this discussion. And I want to say that our neighborhoods in Memphis, Tennessee depend on it. And I'm going to speak for New York City. I think the same is there as well. Thank you. I, th I thank the gentlelady, Mr. Talmadge. Please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for inviting me. Would you please bring that mic up a little bit closer so we can all hear you clear? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hit the button. There we go. How about that? Thank you for inviting me because I think this highlights the problems that we have with understanding economic conditions in inner city neighborhoods in the United States that our own work at Social Compact has found that in your own city of Cleveland, when we worked there in 2002, we found 100,000 people not counted by the U.S. Census that lived in Cleveland. In African-American neighborhoods in Miami, we're finding 95 percent higher populations than have been documented by the U.S. Census. And I think there's, a, there's very little attention or understandings of the market conditions of inner city America. This has impacts at the household level as well as the neighborhood level. In recent work in Harlem, we found that 40 percent of addresses don't have credit scores associated with them. In the city of San Francisco, 33 percent don't. And so this lack of absence, this lack of information has created risk adversity in the commercial lending sector, but risk exuberance in the residential lending sector. But it's based on the same lack of documented information about communities. And I just have to say before I talk about the foreclosure issue that while the scope of the hearing certainly is appropriately focused on the impact of foreclosures, the scale of the problem extends, spills over to a broader community development challenge around retail and whatnot. We, there's emerging evidence now that's beginning to correlate the correlations with obesity and diabetes rates and the lack of access to full service groceries. Those grocery stores are imperiled in underserved markets. There's a group of evidence that's beginning to emerge on the incidence of crime and the saturation of pawn shops and uh, payday lenders and whatnot. And those numbers will continue to increase as our neighborhoods are imperiled. So these same kind of conditions and these kind, same kind of challenges we as a community, whether it's the Urban Institute or Social Compact or the NNIP partnership, are all trying to face every day, are now imperiled because of the lack of understanding we have at the neighborhood, uh, the neighborhood level. In our own work, we've had to create a tool that allows us to understand the foreclosure impact because just this week when we were out at the International Council of Shopping Centers with a variety of cities discussing this work with retailers, they all were interested in what is the foreclosure impact in Detroit or in Cleveland or whatnot. So those 15,000 stores that they may be closing this year and certainly not building will be drawn to these numbers as we begin to propagate them. But by our, depending on national data sets, we're not going to have the full understanding of what's going on in Fruitvale, Oakland or South Central LA or places like that. 
We've had, so because of this, we've had to create a response where we have pro partnered with a variety of private sector pro uh, partners such as property advisors out of Cincinnati, Ohio, First American Coral Logic and university partners to begin to build out our own tools so that we can now assess the market value of every home in the city of Detroit, the foreclosure value of that same home, the abandoned value of that same home, the impact on adjacent properties, the impact on city uh, taxes and whatnot, and do that in a real time meaning because as the city of Detroit begins to address their own foreclosure issues with their own foreclosure office and whatnot, they have to have a dashboard to be able to understand what the impact of this problem is. And just to sort of put this in perspective, when you look at the, the statistics that are being put out there about Wayne County, which Detroit is located in, where the Center for Responsible Lending estimates that the impact on every unit in Wayne County has been a $1,700 impact. The fact of the matter is, if you look at the foreclosure debt itself, it's a $15,000 impact. And this is not on a $200,000 home, this is on a $60,000 home. So the on average, the foreclosure impact has been almost 25%. The market condition for market rate housing, the 65,000 transactions that have been conducted in the last two years, has led to a depressed 10 percent impact across the board on every single home. So that, you know, to the extent, you know, to the, the point that the panel has made, that this is now spilling over greatly on the adjacent properties on other uh, parts of the market. And I think that until we can create the tools that allow us to have the scalable understanding of what the, the individual impact is on households and on neighborhoods, that we can't create the level playing field. And I have to stress that in our own work, having information to be a place where people, stakeholders can come together to understand what the, 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 the existing conditions are, to agree on at least what that information is, is inefficient to try to find lots of other solutions without having that common understanding of what neighborhood conditions are. And so I think that the kind of tools that we're talking about, that Phyllis is talking about, that others are going to talk about, creates the existing conditions that we can all agree on, and then we can build solutions from that. Thank you, sir. I thank the gentleman. We're going to uh, move to questions now to uh, talk about the appropriateness of federal intervention. Professor Bean, you've stated that there's justification for intervening <clears throat> and I think you've said directly to protect neighbors, tenants, and communities. As you may know, however, there is opposition to federal intervention on the grounds that intervening creates a moral hazard. In your opinion, does the specter of a moral hazard arise in a federal intervention to help neighbors? And if it does, what are your thoughts about it? The, the problem of moral hazard uh, usually is... Could you bring, make sure that's on and bring it closer? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, the problem of moral hazard usually, you know, is considered to be the situation where uh, a decision maker is able to escape the costs of some of their decision and therefore may take riskier actions, right? The neighbors of these properties, the tenants of these properties in the community weren't involved in the decision whether or not to take out this loan or whether or not to grant this loan, right? So they're suffering from external effects. They're suffering from costs that they had nothing to do with. Now, I'm not saying that moral hazard won't in some way um, affect the future decisions of those people. I mean, if a neighbor uh, sees, uh, you know, a, one of their neighbors being uh, rescued in some sense, then they may make more risky decisions. But you're trying to balance here the problem of these external effects being imposed upon people who weren't part of the decision which is the classic reason that we always support government intervention, right. right? And you're trying to balance that very real need to protect those third parties who weren't part of the decision against, uh, you know, the moral hazard that, that may be involved uh, you, down the road. And so I think it's that, a balancing test. You've mm -hmm. said that foreclosure-driven blight will not be reversed by a market correction, that foreclosure-driven blight is a public issue requiring public policy interventions. As, as you know, the administration seems to be uh, strike that. This is to uh, uh, Ms. Betts. Mm -hmm. uh, you've said that with respect to foreclosure-driven blight that it requires public policy interventions. As you know, the administration seems to be taking a different view for the moment. What, in your view, is the future of neighborhoods distressed by the subprime mortgage meltdown if they have only the market to correct their problems and no federal intervention? 
I think one of the witnesses earlier was talking about how some properties can be reintegrated into the housing stock by the market, and typically those are going to be the more valuable properties. Uh, I would like to connect that with the discussion here of moral hazard um, in that the brokerage system of independent um, mortgage brokers and independent mortgage companies, um, that part of a dysfunctional mortgage market um, it was highly fraught with moral hazard. Uh, the absence of fiduciary responsibilities on the part of brokers with their clients and so on, uh, that form of market failure is in fact what put us uh, where we are at, at this point in time, uh, such that an intervention uh, that can make a difference uh, in neighborhoods that are on the cusp an intervention that could help revitalize some neighborhoods uh, that are closer to the, preface, the uh, precipice, um, an intervention that can make a difference in inner ring suburbs. Um, I think that the overall cost of this hasn't adequately been uh, calculated by those who would say that this isn't a public policy issue. Uh, I, I want to uh, go back to Professor Bean. You have found that the amount of decrease in housing values that can be attributed to the foreclosure of neighboring property values according to the concentration of varies according to the concentration of foreclosures. Mm -hmm. For the record, will you explain to this subcommittee the difference between looking at the concentration of foreclosures on one hand versus the number of foreclosures on the other? Well, you have to really look at both because obviously a, a neighborhood that's affected by tremendous concentration of foreclosures is destroyed, right? I mean, it's, it's very seriously impacted. But in terms of figuring out the overall effect of foreclosures, you also have to look at the number of properties that are being affected. So, you, you know, think of it as if you have 100 foreclosures all concentrated in one neighborhood versus 100 foreclosures spread out throughout the city, right? The 100 foreclosures that are spread out throughout the city might, in fact, have a greater overall dollar cost because they're near more properties. They're driving down the values of more properties. So you really have to look at both the question of concentration and the total number affected um, by, by the foreclosures. Uh, just a final follow-up question here. The research that you've been involved in shows that the depression of housing values increases as the number of foreclosed property and close proximity increases. Would it be typical that in a given county or metropolitan statistical area or state, you would find certain neighborhoods that have higher concentrations of foreclosures than others, or is it typical that you would find foreclosures equally distributed over large areas? No, foreclosures are very, very concentrated. For example, in New York City, we have what we call 55 neighborhoods, 55 subborough areas. In la the last year, half of the foreclosures were in just nine of those neighborhoods. They are very highly concentrated. And the neighborhoods in which they are concentrated are the ones that have high rates of subprime lending, high rates of people of color, both blacks and Hispanics, um, high rates of other kinds of risky lending. So they are not evenly spread. They are very concentrated according to race and geography. Thank you very much. I am going to go to uh, Congresswoman Watson for just Real question. quickly, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think you probably alluded to uh, my questions. What factors affect the likelihood that a property going into foreclosure will end up vacant? And what factors affect the duration that a property remains uh, vacant? And let me send this one over to Professor Bean. Well, the main factor that affects whether a property go, becomes vacant is the strength of the housing market, right? Where you've got hot markets, strong, uh, strong demand, then the property will be purchased or rented out, uh, you know, fairly quickly. So the strength of the property market is really the main determinant. But other things that will come into play is, the, again, the concentration. It's likely that the concentration of other foreclosed properties will affect it because they add to the housing supply, right? They make many more houses be available to the purchaser who's looking. So that may uh, affect the propensity of the property to actually go uh, into vacancy. In terms of how long they stay in vacancy, again, it's going to be the strength of the property market, which is going to depend upon things like the supply of the housing, what's going on in the broader market. 
Um, so it, it really depends very strongly on the state of the market. And of course, those things are related. The more foreclosures, the more risk that the market is going to fall. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you so very much for this hearing. Uh, we've got votes on the floor, so I'll yield back my time. I, I thank the gentlelady. We're going to uh, take a recess since there are votes. Uh, at the conclusion of votes, we'll come back, and I'm sure that's true of the other members who have uh, been present. Uh, do we know how many votes there are? Four? Yeah, we, uh, I would say we're probably looking at at least a uh, half hour, maybe uh, 40 minutes. So why don't we uh, generally try to be back here by 20 after four? And then we'll proceed with uh, another round of questioning from the witnesses in a second panel, and then we'll go to the next panel. Uh, I, I just uh, wanted, uh, want you to think about this, though, in this uh, break that we're, that's coming up. Again, I, want, I, I would like to have a further discussion about this idea of the wealth accelerating upwards. There is a massive transfer of wealth going on. Somebody is making a lot of money here, mm -hmm. or they already made a lot of money. You know, we could, we could be looking all the way up to hedge funds, and, but there are also all kinds of other players. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that when we come back. Thank you. Uh, this committee is on recess to call the chair. See you right after votes. Committee will come to order. Uh, I would like to go back to Professor B. And you've stated that there are differences between the effects of foreclosures and vacant buildings in hot markets versus cool markets. What are the important differences between foreclosures and vacant properties occurring in one market or the other? And in what ways should federal intervention differ in those so-called hot versus cool markets? And do you think the amount of aid, say, on a per capita basis should be any different for a hot market versus a cool market, and if we could start, start, uh, start by uh, defining terms here, hot market. Okay, a hot market is, is one in which property uh, prices are generally appreciating or at least staying stable, but generally uh, it's considered that property uh, prices are appreciating. Um, I mean, the difference between a, a hot market and a cold market in terms of foreclosures is that if, if the market is hot, if you can turn around and sell your property, when, you, when a, um, a, a borrower goes into distress, can't afford the loan, has some uh, you know, personal crisis that makes them unable to afford the loan, they can usually sell the property and, and walk away without going into foreclosure, risking their credit rating and that kind of thing. If it's a coal market and there's no market for the property, then they don't have that option. And so they may very well then end up in foreclosure um, because they can't sell the property. So. The other difference between uh, hot markets and, and cold markets is that once property does go into foreclosure, in a hot market it's less likely to sit vacant for a long time because the bank is going to be able to sell it, there's going to be a buyer at auction, or there's going to be what we call a short sale. What Do you think there's any difference? Should, should those markets be treated differently in terms of providing any kind of federal aid or intervention? Well, I, I don't think so. I think you have to be very careful there for a couple of reasons. One is that you have impacts from foreclosures on neighboring properties, even in hot markets. I mean, the research that I reported was in New York City. New York City has been, knock on wood, um, a very hot market up until now. But you still see impacts of foreclosures, and that's because even though a property isn't remaining vacant or, or going through the entire foreclosure process, the maintenance is still often lower. The stability of the neighborhood right. is lower. So it still has an, a, a, sends a message. Thank, right? th thank you. Mr. Talmadge, uh, you've done a lot of work in Detroit, Cleveland, St. Louis, among other places. There are, there's a long-suffering 
locations where rising vacant vacancies have been a problem. Has the fact that these cities have pre-existing vacancy problems at all, uh, has, it, has it insulated them at all from the effects of the subprime mortgage meltdown? No, I don't think it's insulated. In fact, I think it's exacerbated. Exacerbate, exacerbated. And you know, in the case of Detroit, where you you know you've declined from a, a population of two million to one million. Could could you make sure that mic is on? Yes, sir. Is this better? Okay, that's good. In the case of Detroit, where you've you've you, the population has uh, fallen from two million to one million in 50 years, and you already had a blighted uh, pr uh, property situation to begin with. Whole scales of the tracks of the city are, are blighted. That by adding another 35,000 foreclosures onto those rolls in the last two years, that the 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 velocity of decrease has changed much more rapidly than in other places such as cities along the East Coast. How would foreclosures that occurred, let's say, in 2000, or you know, or a little later, show up today in the neighborhoods? Would they be vacant? Would they be owner occupied? Would they be vacant or owner occupied? If, if I think the foreclosures that are impacted. What was it like in 2000? Right, in 2000, you had you had new. I'll, I'll use Detroit as my example. The city of Detroit had led the MSA in the number of transactions uh, for the last five years, meaning that the number of home sales that were uh, being transacted was the highest rate than of any of the surrounding communities. The number of new housing permits, the number of rehabilitation permits led that MSA as well for the same period. The foreclosure rate, and you can see the velocity of the numbers of homes that were, were provided high cost loans, uh, increased from 2003 to, to four, to, and then five, then six, and that that velocity has increased more, you know, mm -hmm. in a tremendous speed. So I think that when it the, the really is true that we're going to see 60,000 foreclosures in the city of Detroit this year, that that impact is going to have a much higher impact on values of other. Uh, community assets, whether it's households or not, than anything we could have forecasted today. So you see a velocity trend occurring that we haven't seen the bottom yet. Uh, Professor Bean, I, I think I remember in your discussion, and maybe Ms. Betts got into it as well, uh, the greatest amount of subprime loans went into areas that have been, uh, that are primarily uh, minority, African American in many cities, like in my city of Cleveland. We've seen other counties. Uh, uh, similarly situated, perhaps in uh, communities that you're talking about in Shelby yes. County. Let's go back a little bit. 30 years bef ago, uh, or a little bit longer, President uh, Carter saw the Community Reinvestment Act come forward, affirmative obligation on the part of lending institutions to lend money into communities that had previously been denied credit or been redlined. Okay? Is it in your and in your estimation of any, anyone here, was the um, lending institutions certainly knew where they weren't spending money. Is it possible that uh, someone just you know that lending institutions looked at a map in your estimation and determined well you know we haven't loaned money here we're not in compliance with the Community Reinvestment Act we'll package these subprime loans send them out there and who cares if anybody can pay them off or not? Uh, is there have any of you thought about that at all? Anyone yeah, want to try? I, I've actually looked at that quite a bit. Our local retail banks, which are the ones that were to be scrutinized under the Community Reinvestment Act, um, are responsible. Talk closer to the mic, okay? Bring the mic closer. Our local retail banks are responsible for uh, less than 20 percent of the originations, mortgage originations in Shelby County. Yeah. Uh, the slack has been taken up by the national independent mortgage companies, most of which are not depository institutions and are, which are regulated in a different way. The local retail banks have been able to stick with the uh, most lucrative business locally um, and basically have not been uh, held accountable for um, the kind of lending neighborhood to neighborhood that was originally envisioned by, by the Community Reinvestment Act. Uh, the breach was filled by this other set of lenders and some of us in fact talk about predatory green lining. It was almost as though we drew a green line around these particular neighborhoods and targeted them for these particular kinds of loan products. I would like, uh, uh, you know, do, does anyone else have a response to that 
No, I would just echo that. I think uh, Phyllis is absolutely right that in Cleveland, you know, it wasn't the actions of Key Bank or in Detroit. I mean, the, the, by larger numbers than what she was saying in Memphis, the the amount, the number of loans, the re, the percent of loans that were given by the the unregulated broker community far exceeded what national averages were. So I think that if you were to look at you know a market in itself or a census block in itself and where those loans originated from, that you would come back and say it's clearly the unregulated community. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really um, important for this subcommittee to, as we get deeper into this issue of uh, subprime, to look at where the mortgages originated. Uh, they may vary community by community, but clearly, at some point, somewhere in some market, somebody made a decision and said, if we can write tens of millions of dollars in subprime, subprime loans, forget the documentation, we can then sell those upstream, mm -hmm. capitalize on them, and who cares what happens afterwards. I mean, at some point, somebody did that at some point, and we're going to keep tracking that in this community. What I'd like to do, and I'd like members of uh, the panel, if you find an area that you think is worth looking at in the communities that you've worked with or that you've studied, uh, we'd appreciate any kind of amendment to your testimony or addendum that we could include in uh, what you've already contributed, which has been uh, pretty significant. Uh, Mr. Tierney, did you have a follow-up question? Just a, a couple of wrap-up questions. Yeah, please do. That. Um, Ms. Bean, if we wanted to identify the external effects of foreclosures, what would be the appropriate unit of analysis? Uh, would, a, would a zip code level be better than a county? Uh, would, it, you know, would a census tract be better than a zip code? Or would a block uh, be better than a census tract? I mean, what's the right analysis of vehicle to use there for purposes of where we should direct federal funds? Well, generally, in, in thinking about the external effects, you want to think about the neighborhood. And the unit that maps on imperfectly, but maps on best, is typically a census tract. Now, you don't always have data by a census tract. And then you tend to go up to a zip code level and then to a county level. But you really want to start at the neighborhood. I mean, neighborhoods across a city are very, very different. So if you look at a city as a whole or a county as a whole, you're going to miss a lot of variation in what it is that those neighborhoods need. Okay. In keeping with that, I think we just ought to put something on the record that's some, what's well, simplistic to all of us. And, but if, you, if we want to bring these things down to the, the values, right down to the label of the neighborhood pocketbook on this, if the neighbor had equity in a house that was about 28 percent of value uh, and then his house lost that 28 percent of value because the property next to it was vacant, they've essentially been wiped out. Uh, they've lost all that savings. They've lost whatever wealth they had in their house, right? They've lost, you they've know, lost. if they try to sell the house, they certainly will not make as much as they would otherwise. Right. They and don't that have that. If that was all they had, then, then they're obviously in pretty dire straits. So I think the record can reflect that foreclosure crises, uh, when you have a lot of vacant properties, they robbed a, a number of neighbors of, of their wealth on that. So yes. the long-term consequences uh, for, the, for a community like that uh, what societal consequences of these neighbors losing their equity in that way do you foresee? Well, I think the societal consequences are several fold, right? One is, I mean, we've seen what that looks like. It looked like the Bronx in the 70s, where you have neighborhoods that are pockmarked by abandoned buildings, um, and it's very hard to get that neighborhood back together. Um, the second major societal consequence is that these are neighborhoods that during the 80s and the 90s and, and this decade, we've poured massive amounts of city, state, and federal investments in, and that's going to be lost. That's taxpayers' money that, you know, is going to be lost. And it's not just government money, but it's private investment, it's foundation investment that's all being wiped out. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, I You know, in, in connection with that, this is uh, very significant. Uh, part of our discussion because I can go back to my own neighborhood, uh, my own district in Cleveland, and for example, there's an area called the Forest City Park area. Uh, there were several parks in the community, and you can see when there's a decline in the um, residential housing stock, the infrastructure, the public infrastructure, experiences a similar decline. So there is a loss of value. I mean, you can actually see it. And that's something that when we talk about the, the transfer of wealth, that's a transfer of wealth from the public, mm -hmm. away from the public. So Mr. Tierney, thank you. I yield back no, to Mr. Tierney. Ms. Betts, Ms. Thomas, do you want to add anything to that or we pretty much cover that ground? 
I, I would just underscore uh, that in a lot of markets, and I would look at medium-sized cities in the South and the Midwest in particular, not so-called Rust Belt cities, um, where middle-income neighborhoods that didn't get actually a lot of the federal money and that have been a substantial source of the tax base and the primary source of wealth building for all of those families in the middle that if we increasingly have upscale neighborhoods and downscale neighborhoods, then the impact on individual families will be difficulty in wealth building that can be passed generation to generation. And the impact on neighborhoods will be that if you're not in an upscale neighborhood, then you're going to be experiencing a, a lot of the issues that the neighborhoods um, that Professor Bean has talked about have experienced for years. And I don't think that's where we want to go with our cities. Remember. Yes, sir. I would also, I think that the, uh, the the unit of analysis really should be at the block group level, if not the household level. And I, th I do think that the uh, data exists. It's hard to come by. It's, it's not necessarily formatted for this use, but I think that's something that could be addressed. Uh, but on the, the social impact, I think one of the things that we see in the cities that we're working with around the country is that there's a tremendous amount of pressure on cities to begin decommissioning neighborhoods, uh, to, to remove public services from entire uh, communities. And you know, this was something that the, the Bronx had thought about back in the 70s. And I think that that, that kind of public policy um, uh, agenda it could have a long run consequence that would accelerate some of the, the, the household wealth impacts that we've, uh, we've seen over the last decade by for, not forcing, but asking neighbor communities or individual households to relocate to other neighbors where they're not connected to or whatnot. And I think that it's the, the law of unintended consequences that if we don't sort of grapple with this now, understand what the impact is at the household level and at the neighbor level, that some of these very bad public policy decisions will move forward. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I may ask one closing question. I will my time a little bit here. Mr. Talmadge, in your written testimony, you thought that the, uh, the value of the equity stripped uh, in Detroit was about a billion dollars. Yes, sir. Do you have an estimate of what you think it is nationwide? No, but we have a methodology to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank my, my colleague. Uh, again, continuing this discussion about infrastructure. I mentioned a park and how that's deteriorated. But also, think about this in terms of neighborhoods, because you have an investment of a public infrastructure, a water system, sewer system, uh, electricity, telecommunications. That's all there. If people are, if no one's, if there's a substantial decrease in the population of an area because of foreclosures. There, there's a loss of revenue to those companies and also the, the infrastructure can deteriorate as well, um, and which requires greater repairs. I mean, you, can, you can see the damage when you go into some of these communities. So it can be a public loss of, of revenue, which actually can turn around and increase the cost to other ratepayers if it's a utility because you, don't, you have less rate payers. And uh, it can increase the cost of water and sewer as well. So you, you, know, you have a cycle here of cost transfers that just it, it sometimes uh, seem not to end. I, I'm uh, grateful for the panel's participation. Uh, we'll have some follow-up questions from the committee staff uh, after this hearing, I can assure you. And your, uh, uh, the, the, the quantification that you bring to this discussion is extremely important, and it's going to be very useful as this committee continues to go further. Uh, we're going to dismiss the second uh, panel with the thanks of the subcommittee and call the uh, next panel forward. Uh, th thank you very much. Thank you. its uh, place. Uh, we're fortunate to have outstanding witnesses on our third panel. Uh, we have Mr. Alan uh, Malik, is the senior fellow at the National Housing Institute. His work focuses on housing and community development policy issues, including vacant and abandoned property issues, housing investment strategies, marked based uh, urban regeneration. In 2006, uh, Mr. Malik published a book on abandoned property strategies entitled 
bringing buildings back, turning abandoned properties into community assets. Mr. Doug Leeper is the Code Enforcement Manager for the City of Chula Vista, California. He's owner of the Code Enforcement Solutions Consulting Firm. Over the course of his career, Mr. Leeper has supervised the enforcement of 30,000 cases, 1,100 warranted abatements, and 275 warranted demolitions. Mr. Dean Baker is the co-founder and co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. He has previously worked as a senior economist at the Economic Policy Institute and assistant professor at Bucknell University. Dr. Baker has, offered, has authored numerous books and articles, including his recent publication entitled The United States Since 1980. Uh, Dr. Baker earned his PhD in economics from the University of Michigan. I want to thank the witnesses for appearing in front of the subcommittee today. It's the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. Please rise and raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear the testimony that you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, let the uh, record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. And uh, I would uh, ask, as in previous panels, that each witness give an oral testimony, uh, a summary of your testimony. Keep this summary under five minutes in duration. Please keep in mind that your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record, so we won't miss a word of what you have to tell us. Uh, Mr. Malik, if you'd uh, like to start. And please pull that microphone close so we can hear you. <coughs> if staff would uh, assist uh, Mr. Malik in making sure that microphone is. Thank please you. Proceed. Yeah. And first, I want to commend the committee for tackling this issue and also for focusing on the neighborhood and property aspects of these issues, which are so often overlooked. I'd like to suggest that tackling this issue really requires two separate types of action. One is to enable capable local governments and nonprofits to get control of properties so they can be properly maintained and properly reused. But the other part is actions to minimize the harm that vacant properties do while they're vacant and before they can be reused. And I'd like to touch on both of these very quickly. Every city, town, county in this country has the ability to minimize harm from vacant properties through its code enforcement and nuisance abatement resources. And every state gives communities power in these areas. But many communities don't do this for a number of reasons. One, they lack the resources for effective code enforcement. Secondly, their programs are poorly organized or ineffective. Thirdly, for financial or other reasons, they're unwilling to use their powers, particularly to step in where the owners won't maintain their properties. And the foreclosure issue has added a fourth problem, which I think a previous speaker alluded to, which is this extended period of limbo where nobody is responsible. And while I know Chula Vista has attacked this issue, in most parts of the country, it's not being addressed because there is no law, no body of law, that clearly makes lenders who have initiated foreclosures take on the responsibility for properties if the borrower has vacated the property. And without this, in many states which have judicial foreclosure processes, the process can take anything from nine months to over two years, from the point where the foreclosure starts till the point where title actually passes. And during this period, these properties typically fall in limbo, they are abandoned, they deteriorate, and by the time that title passes, if it ever does pass, which in many cases is not the case, because in some communities, and I know this happens in Cleveland, lenders will initiate the foreclosure, but may not aggressively pursue it, and the property will sit in limbo essentially forever. So cities need help in developing the ability to enforce their codes, to undertake nuisance abatements, to go after the people who are responsible and hold them accountable. And this is something where clearly the federal government is not going to be able to do it, but a very small amount of money directed at building local capacity and helping them in this area could reap enormous dividends in terms of helping to mitigate harm. The second area 
is the question of controlling the properties. <clears throat> and here I would differ from a previous speaker with respect to the weak market versus strong market or hot versus cold issues. In hot markets, first, if a property goes into foreclosure in Palo Alto or Scarsdale, New York, the lender is going to make sure that it maintains its value. And once title passes, the odds are it will go very quickly into the hands of, an, of a responsible buyer. There really is less need for money to acquire properties on the part of the public sector or the nonprofit sector where there is a strong market environment. In Cleveland, in Detroit, in Buffalo, the lenders are not doing that. The properties are going into limbo and money is needed, resources are needed to acquire those properties if they're not going to continue to do harm to the community. So I think there is a significant difference in that respect between hot markets and cold markets. But I think the other issue is that money is not the only issue. Yes, local governments, nonprofits need money to acquire properties. But at this point, in many cities, the capacity both to acquire, maintain, manage, and dispose of properties responsibly simply does not exist. If you gave money in many cities, they would not be able to spend it responsibly. A second, or a third issue rather, which is equally important, is getting the people who control these properties to the table. To my knowledge, at this point, while there have been a few transactions around the country where lenders or servicers have sold small bundles of properties after they've taken title to nonprofits or local governments like the Michigan State Land Bank, I don't think there's been a single case where a local government or a nonprofit has successfully negotiated the sale of paper, the mortgages prior to foreclosure with a lender. And yet, if you wait to the point when it's an REO, a real estate owned property, and then only then start negotiating, the odds are that the property will have significantly deteriorated. A recent national survey of realtors found that over 50% of the REO properties that got into the hands of realtors had already suffered significant property damage. And this is a cross-section of not just of the Clevelands and Detroits, but of the Las Vegases and the Palo Altos and the San Diegos. So unless we can figure out a way, or put it differently, Congress can figure out a way to motivate lenders, servicers, the people in the financial industry to negotiate seriously and responsibly with people who will take the paper and take responsibility for these properties, we will see this problem continue to mushroom. And again, and this goes also to the question of how resources are allocated, this is, this is not an issue that is even for all foreclosures. All foreclosures are bad, but foreclosures in Las Vegas ultimately will be resolved by the economic growth and the job growth in the Las Vegas area. Foreclosures in Dayton or Buffalo will not be. So again, thank you for your attention, and I hope that this is useful. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayock. Mr. Leeper, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to be here, and it's an honor to represent the code enforcement profession throughout the United States. In, a, in anticipation of the record number of potential foreclosures on their horizon, the City of Chula Vista drafted and passed an abandoned residential properties ordinance. Vacant property registration ordinances are nothing new and have been existing in some cities for decades. The Chula Vista ordinance had a slightly different <clears throat> reason and focus. The black hole, or the limbo we've spoke of before, between default and foreclosure sale. When in many cases, the home sits empty, the borrowers are gone, and the lender won't take responsibility for it. This is the period of time when the great deal of damage can and deterioration can occur. Although the lenders claim they have no rights to the property prior to the actual foreclosure sale, we found the opposite to be true. This truth came in the way of a standard clause within the mortgage contract. 
commonly referred to as the Abandonment and Waste Clause. Simply put, the clause allows lenders to secure and maintain property against vandalism, theft, and waste. If the borrower stops making payments and moves out, in short, they abandon the property. Lenders don't like to exercise this right and in many cases won't admit that it exists. The Chula Vista Ordinance, nicknamed the Good Neighbor Ordinance, simply requires the lenders to secure and maintain their investment, which in turn helps stabilize the surrounding neighborhood. In short, be a good neighbor. After all, what would they want done if it was across the street from their house or next door to their child's school? They would want it maintained to the neighborhood standard. That's what our ordinance requires, security and maintenance to the neighborhood standard. As the committee is aware, a law without consequence is merely words on paper. The consequences for violation of the Chula Vista <coughs> ordinance range from criminal prosecution, not feasible in most cases, fines or abatement. Chula Vista did not budget for becoming the gardener and property manager for the 2,000 plus vacant abandoned properties we, we have now. And with the downturn in the economy, whatever we're calling it, we don't have the means to do it now. Our single best option to gain the attention of the lenders was monetary fines and penalties. As a code enforcement manager, my bottom line is people, quality of life, neighborhood livability. The lender's bottom line is dollars. So until it became more expensive for them to ignore us than to properly maintain their properties, they continued to ignore us. Early on, we were <clears throat> informed by the lending industry that we couldn't pass such a law and that they wouldn't adhere to it. Registrations were slow at first, but with the first round of penalties, ranging from $3,000 to $10,000 per property, lenders soon acknowledged that the city of Chula Vista meant business. Currently, there are approximately 450 properties registered in Chula Vista. Most are in compliance with the, <clears throat> with the neighborhood standard and are posted. We require posting of a name and phone number of a local contractor responsible for the upkeep of the property. So neighbors don't have to rely on the city to call, they can call directly to the responsible party if there's a problem with the property. Unfortunately, the rate of foreclosures and vacant properties has accelerated past six a day. <clears throat> but our staffing remains the same. I was forced to realign resources and suspend enforcement on other important issues to address the disgrace of abandoned properties. And if it continues at this rate, I'll have to do it again, leaving other issues unaddressed. One of the reasons these are difficult to uh, deal with is the research required to track down the current beneficiary of the mortgage. These notes rarely stay with the party of issuance. They are bought, sold, and traded like baseball cards. Rarely, if ever, does the new beneficiary, be it a lender, a mortgage company, a trust, or a security, record their newfound interest in the property. This leaves the local jurisdictions grasping at straws in an attempt to locate someone, anyone that will take, admit to holding an interest in the property. One of our first problem properties came by way of a $30,000 fine for noncompliance while the initiator, the originator of the loan argued with the, the entity they sold it with as to who was responsible. The property sat vacant and vandalized for three months before they finally decided. They then spent $16,000 to bring the property in compliance and asked that I uh, waive their fines and penalties. I did not. Due in part to its <coughs> new focus, Chula Vista's ordinance received some press and attention from other cities, almost 200 cities throughout the nation. The California State Assembly is considering passing legislation based on Chula Vista's ordinance. The cost to local jurisdictions from this foreclosure fallout is near incalculable. HOA dues, homeowners dues go unpaid and services go un undone. Delinquent taxes, reduced property taxes, increased calls for service through theft, vandalism, fraud, and arson, increased insurance rates for neighbors, reduction in other city services, and displaced renters. I was recently contacted by a young lady by the name of Esther who was in a panic. There was a default notice on her door. She was very upset because her husband is currently deployed with the United States Navy and she didn't know what to do. We were able to get her in touch with the, the lender that holds the note, but all the while, the landlord has been cashing their checks. <clears throat> The U.S. Conference of Mayors, Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the Mortgage Bankers Association all agree that one of these vacant, abandoned, unmaintained homes can have a negative Im financial impact for other homes within an eighth of a mile. What will the, uh, the impact of two be, of 10, of 30? And the <clears throat> these impacts are not only financial, but are also emotional. As the American dream turns into a neighborhood nightmare, as brand new neighborhoods slip into blighted ghost towns, 
as other existing neighborhoods that saw redevelopment as a light at the end of the tunnel find that that light is now the train of foreclosures and abandoned properties. I can't tell you the cost of my city, not yet anyway. I do know the problem is beyond my sleepy little San Diego suburb. It's national, red states and blue. I've heard estimates <clears throat> that we as a nation may see as many as 2 million to 3 million foreclosures. That's equal to every single family home in the state of Missouri. Or at a rate of 3.75 people per home, that's the entire population of Georgia. <clears throat> By all means, the best answer is to keep as many borrowers, better stated homeowners, who occupy the homes in their homes as possible. Short of that, it will be left to the local jurisdictions to fight the war against vacant abandoned properties. And as any battle requires weapons like Chula Vista and troops on the ground, which none of us, at least none of the cities I've talked to, are prepared for. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for his testimony. Mr. Baker, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Kucinich. I appreciate the opportunity to address the committee. Um, I'm going to take a little different tack than I think most of the other witnesses have in the sense that what I want to talk about is a concrete measure that I think would directly affect the amount of foreclosures, the number of foreclosures we're seeing by simply changing the rules on foreclosure. And the essence of this is actually, uh, I call this an own to rent concept, that we give um, people facing foreclosure <coughs> the option to stay in their home as a long-term tenant. And a version of this was actually introduced just today by Representative Gravila in the form of the Saving Family Homes Act of 2008. And I'd argue that this is, in effect, the most effective way available to Congress to stem the looming foreclosure crisis. The basic concept is very simple. Um, we simply put in a clause that at least temporarily changes the foreclosure laws so that we set a date, I believe, in the law, it's July uh, of last year, July of 2007, that mortgages issued prior to July 2007, if they go into foreclosure, the, the homeowner would have the option to stay in their home as a tenant paying the fair market rent. And this would be very carefully targeted. It would only apply to uh, occupants of homes that sold for less than the median price in the area at the time the home was purchased. And it would also only apply to owner-occupied homes. And one of the nice um, aspects of this is that that owner-occupied clause, we know this is f frequently exploited. Uh, very often people are not always honest in claiming that they're owner-occupants. In this case, that really will not do you any good. You are only going to benefit if you actually are, in fact, an owner-occupant. Otherwise, the right to stay there as a tenant is not really worth anything. So in that sense, it's a very nicely done, uh, very nicely targeted measure. The other aspects of it, uh, it requires an appraisal of the fair market rent. This also is easily done. We have a well-developed appraisal system for, um, for sale prices. You would simply do the same, determining what the market rent for a house would be, and that would in turn be adjusted by the Consumer Price Index, which is readily available each year from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, it also has a very nice feature. It requires no tax dollars. We don't have to go running around trying to take money from programs for low-income tenants. Um, it requires no tax dollars. It doesn't require any government money to fund it. It requires no new bureaucracy. Everything is already in place. It's simply part of the foreclosure structure. We don't have to set up a new bureaucracy. And that also means that it could be implemented without delay. We don't have to, you know, put this in place and then wait for three months, six months to make sure that we have the administrative apparatus to deal with it. As soon as Congress were to pass the law, it could immediately take effect. Now, the benefits, I think, are very direct and very clear. Um, first and foremost, obviously, it ensures housing security, that in the event you have a homeowner that likes their home, um, they like the schools, they like the neighborhood, they have the option to stay there as a tenant. Um, it also means that the house doesn't go vacant, obviously, if they're staying there. So we don't have the problem of vacant property being stripped, being vandalized, being used as a crack house, you know, et cetera, the issues that have already been raised. We don't have that problem. Um, also, and I think this is a very important, perhaps the most important part of it, is I actually think it will secure home ownership. Because the point here is you make foreclosure a much less attractive option for the lender. They can't simply throw the person out on the street. They're stuck with the tenant for a long period of time. Recognizing that this is a much less attraction option, attractive option, the lender is far more likely to sit down and try to negotiate terms with the homeowner that will keep them in the house as a homeowner, which I think is everyone's first best solution. And this, in effect, puts some muscle behind 
the exhortations that President Bush and others have made urging lenders to do just that. Um, so I, I argue that in, in many ways this would accomplish exactly what we want as a very well-targeted and costly measure. Let me answer one objection, because I've discussed this with many economists, and the, the objection that most often has been raised, and I'll mention one economist in particular that raised it a few weeks ago when we were testifying together, uh, Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary, complained that he thought it was good, this would be the best way to keep people in their home, but he objected because he felt this would interfere with the sanctity of contract. And what I'd just say on that is that I, I view the sanctity of contract also as being very important, but I will note that there are certainly times where Congress has felt it was appropriate to override concerns about sanctity of contract. And the most obvious case that I could mention in the recent past was that when they recently changed the, the bankruptcy law, um, they chose to apply that retroactively to debt, to debt that was incurred under pre-existing bankruptcy law. So in that particular case, in a case where we changed the law in a way that was adverse to creditors, Congress apparently was not concerned about the sanctity of contract. So I would say that that need not be you know, an overriding concern, an important concern, but need not be an overriding concern. Lastly, just in commenting on this, I have talked about this uh, around uh, Washington, around the country a fair bit, and I'd point out that this is actually an idea that's attracted a lot of bipartisan support. Uh, some of the strongest proponents are actually um, fairly conservative Republicans. Uh, I mentioned uh, Desmond Lockman, who's a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, has been a very strong proponent of this proposal. Uh, another person uh, of some prominence, Andrew Samwick, who was a top economist in President Bush's administration, again, was a very strong proponent. We, in fact, co-authored a, a column on it advocating this sort of solution. So just to sum up, I think that, in principle, we can do something here that offers us a very, uh, very quick, very costless, very bureaucracy-free way of dealing with the most immediate and worst effects of this problem. So I'll conclude my testimony there. I just do want to add I would very much welcome the opportunity to address the question you uh, raised with other witnesses about moral hazard. I think I have some interesting, some things you may find interesting on that topic. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Baker. Uh, to go to questions of the panel. I'd like to uh, begin with the discussion with Mr. Leeper about property maintenance. Your city is holding the lenders responsible for upkeep of vacant properties. I think uh, People on this subcommittee would be interested. How does the city of Chula Vista hold Wells Fargo, for example, a $48 billion company, number 41 on the Fortune 500? How do you hold them accountable? My father told me that money talks. All mine says is goodbye. Well, there's but. another part of that equation. <laughs> that. <laughs> That's true. And we don't walk. Uh, I have contacts in Wells Fargo now that I can call directly when we find a property. The hardest part is finding who owns the note now. But once we find that, it, that Wells Fargo Home Mortgage holds this note, I have an email address and a direct phone number now to someone in Des Moines, Iowa, where their uh, problem property division is, uh, that has had shown such interest that they've actually flown out to Chula Vista to look at our city and really? see what the impacts are. Do you issue fines to scoff laws? Yes, we do. And have you sued to enforce your ordinance? We uh, have uh, liened properties. Our, our liens are, go on as a special assessment on the property taxes, and they are paid. And uh, are you keeping up with the problem with this ordinance? We were initially. It has uh, gone to where I have to add staff now, take them off of other items that are as important. But Do, do municipalities need additional funding for code enforcement? In a word, yes. You know, this is one of those issues that relates to HUD, and um, we, you know, we in, in the past we had a general revenue sharing that cities could then draw from and determine what their uh, needs were and be able to apply money accordingly. But if we would, you, would you agree that if cities are going to be empowered to deal effectively with uh, the effects of the subprime scandal? That, there, that housing enforcement is where it begins. Yes, code enforcement is a very code enforcement. It, code enforcement is, is a very integral Mr. Mallock, cog did, in the. In did the you want to get in on that? Yeah, if I could add to that, first I agree 100 percent. I think they do need additional resources, but they also, and I, I think this is particularly the case in the older cities in the Midwest and the Northeast. They also need significant help building their capacity to do it right. 
using technology so they can operate efficiently. What capacity needs to be built? Well, the skills, the skills of the inspectors, the ability of the depart code enforcement departments to organize their work so they are not complaint driven but systematic, their ability to use the kind of technology that increases their efficiency and gets away from creating mounds of paper that typically get lost. Does federal government have any role in that at all? They could, well, I'll say two things. One, certainly financial help could be done. The other thing, and I know the federal government has done this in the past in other areas, is condition other assistance on getting your local house in order. Right. So that you have to have a properly functioning code enforcement and nuisance abatement operation <clears throat> in order, say, to be eligible for property acquisition or demolition money. What about incentives required in dealing with the real estate industry? Pardon? I'm sorry. What about incentives that uh, may be required in dealing with the real estate industry? Are you concerned about creating a moral hazard, and would you characterize what, okay. you know, any aspect of what we're talking about here as being a bailout? I, I am very concerned about a moral hazard issue there, and I find myself very much torn, because I think unless, and this has to be done, I think, at the national level. W the, would you define for people who are, uh, you know, may have just joined us, uh, what you mean by moral hazard? A moral hazard is essentially where you bail out somebody who has misbehaved and thereby give the rest of the universe encouragement to similarly misbehave in anticipation that they too give us an example out. well again suppose if and this is an extreme case suppose the, the federal government offered to buy out people's <clears throat> more these mortgages that are now underwater at 100 cents on the dollar that would send a message to everybody involved in the financial world that they could conduct their business the way the subprime industry has done so for the past eight or ten years right. and get away and that the federal government would bail them out. Thank you. I, I want to uh, ask uh, Mr. Baker here before I go to Mr. Tierney. As an economist, what would you say to the objection raised by the administration that uh, the bill that Congress just passed, H.R. 5818, creates a moral hazard and constitutes a bailout, what would you say? I think there are, Could there you? can be some issues of moral hazard, but that's going to be true in almost anything the government does, that there's always some issues. I think in this case they're relatively limited. And I would just point out it's ironic that this administration would get upset about the moral hazard in that case, but they've been completely unconcerned about the moral hazard involved in the Federal Reserve Board's recent actions vis-a-vis -vis the investment banks, because this really goes very much to the heart of the housing crisis we're seeing. What Ben Bernanke, the chair of the Federal Reserve Board, said is that he's going to come to the aid of the investment banks in the sense that he will back them up if they get into trouble. This does two things. On the one hand, it gives the investment banks a free ride in having been very heavily over leveraged. They're paying no price for that. Their shareholders, their top executives, they made enormous fortunes from over leveraging themselves, something I think almost everyone agrees on. And Ben Bernanke has said that the Fed, the agent of the government, the central bank is going to hold them harmless. Secondly, the investors. We talk about the international investment flows. These people obviously didn't know what they're doing. What the market is supposed to say is, well, then you lose your shirt. But what Ben Bernanke said is, no, the federal <coughs> government through its central bank is going to come in and guarantee your bad debts. So that's a huge aspect of moral hazard that's really very much at the center of this problem because if they didn't mindlessly provide that money and if the, if the investment banks had become some over, over leveraged, we wouldn't have seen the sort of run up in housing prices, the sort of explosion of subprime lending. That couldn't have happened. So that's moral hazard very much at the heart of the story and to the best of my knowledge, the Bush administration has been silent on it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Baker. Uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you. Well, just uh, so you'll know, the people in my district didn't miss that. Uh, you know, when I go uh, around community meetings, they, they get that right away. Well, that's good. You know, what about the Bear Stearns clients all got bailed out, and, uh, and here we are, you know, worried about an individual homeowner and, and what's the difference on that. Uh, Mr. Baker, I'm, I'm interested in your proposal. Uh, you, you mentioned you target only those houses that have a value less than the median price of the, of the market in that area. Is that what you said? That's correct. Explain to me why that is. 
Well, again, this is something obviously in an actual passage you would decide who you want to benefit from it. But my idea in tying it to the, the median home price in the area, and I believe uh, Representative Gravala stuck to that in his, uh, his uh, bill, is that you want to help the people who are sort of least able to deal with the problems themselves. Now, if you go envision going to higher price homes, we might say that those people bear more responsibility for their own actions. Now, whether the median price is the best place to cut that off, that's, you know, a judgment call. Maybe you'd want to have that be higher, but I think at some point, if we're talking about million dollar homes, we might sort of, you know, bristle at the idea that these people aren't able to take care of themselves. Okay. No, it, it just seemed a little arbitrary for me because at some point somebody's just over the edge and, and I didn't know if there was some other re rationale for that. I think we may want to look and how we measure that, because certainly some people might pay a little more than median uh, value, but still be in just as much trouble and uh, sort of an equivalent fault issue on that. But uh, thank you for the, for the answer on that. Um, so it seems to me what that does sets up a situation where the lender is not getting paid back on their on their loan, but they foreclose. They can't get the people out of the house if they don't foreclose, and the person rents it. Their fair market value of the rent may not equal what they were getting on their loan. And how does that not uh, become a, a confiscation of their property? Well, it's it's certainly a loss for the for the uh, lender. They are going to be taking a loss on the property. And the issue here is, you know, what sort of enforcement mechanisms is the government prepared to make available to the lender? And in this case, again, I'd make the analogy to what happened with the reform of the bankruptcy law a few years back, that there you had people took out debt under one set of bankruptcy rules, which were comparatively lenient, and then the government changed that. And to my knowledge, at least, now maybe there is a court case I'm not familiar with, but to my knowledge, at least, that's not been contested at all in court. They said the government was free to change the enforcement rules after the fact. So there certainly is an aspect here that the lenders will take a loss, because obviously they're not getting their preferred course of enforcement, so they are taking a loss, but they are being compensated. But, you know, again, I'm not a lawyer here. I don't know. I was going to ask you if, you if you happen to have some lawyers look at that in terms of the constitutional implications of taking on that. If they basically have somebody paying less than their value, then it's not really sort of a, uh, an enforcement mechanism. It's actually you've, you've disallowed them the use of their property and stopped them from enforcing their mortgage to them and given them less in return. Uh, I mean, I don't. The, the lawyers I have spoken to on that, I have spoken to a number of lawyers, did. In, in their view, they thought it would, uphold, it would be upheld in the courts since they are getting compensation. So it's not a question that they're, they're, not, they're getting nothing. They're getting compensation. They aren't getting as much compensation as they would like, but they are getting compensated. Interesting. Can I just ask each of the other two gentlemen what your thoughts are on that proposal? First, I should say I think it's basically a very good idea. And in fact, I should mention that I've been working with a coalition in New Jersey, and we have recently gotten a bill introduced in the both houses of the New Jersey State Legislature, which among other things would enact a similar provision. But I think there's one difference in which I think responds to your issue, which the way it's written under the New Jersey bill, and this hasn't become law yet, clearly, is that the owner would be allowed to remain in the property as a tenant and pay the fair market rent, except if the the lender who had taken title to it subsequently sells it to a party who wants to use it for their own domicile, then the owner would be given 60 days notice, which is the requirement under the state anti-eviction law, and then would be required to vacate in order that the new buyer could move in. So in that case, the, own, the, the lender the has no loss whatsoever because at the point when the lender is ready to have the property actually be utilized, the former owner has to vacate. But the principle is still the same. The owner should be allowed to remain in the property as a tenant as long as they can. Okay. Mr. Lever? Yes, I, I've had conversations with some of the lending uh, folks in the lending industry that are actually, in, at least in Chula Vista, considering leaving those people in the property because then it's not vacant and subject to our ordinance, which I'm all for. Occupied properties uh, fall victim to theft and vandalism far fewer, uh, you know, at a far lesser rate than, than unoccupied properties. They're generally more maintained and, and they don't become the, the rotting tooth and the smile of the neighborhood. Uh, so anything that they can do to, to continue to keep the neighborhood as stable as possible, be it a, an own to rent uh, or even leaving 
good solid renters in uh, you know while the property is being marketed to somebody who wants to uh, use that uh, residence as an, to uh, owner occupy would be a, a, a good thing Thank you. Mr. Baker, what do you say to Mr. Malik in New Jersey's uh, adjustment to your proposal? Well, I think it would be, you know, it, obviously a lot will depend what's on the table, what's politically feasible, and you're the better one to answer that than me. But, you know, I think that would be certainly a very big improvement over current law. Now, it gives less security to the homeowners facing foreclosure, so I would prefer, you know, something that gives them the option to stay there as a long-term tenant. But certainly that would be much better than the situation as it is now, because in many cases they will be able to stay there for a substantial period of time, and it does certainly address the problem that we won't have the property going vacant. So it does get us much of the way there. Right. And according to the real estate industry, occupied properties are more marketable as well. So it, it retains the value and, and helps, you know, retain the value of the entire neighborhood. Great. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I have to leave, but I, I want to tell you, I, I want to thank you for having this hearing and for the excellent witnesses that you presented and thank all of them. Uh, you really help us think through this issue and, and bring it down to the neighborhood level where it affects us all. Uh, and so thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience and waiting through the votes that unfortunately interrupt us in these afternoon hearings. But uh, I want to congratulate you and thank you on the hearing, Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Chairman, as always, your participation uh, helps make a difference in the hearing. Thank you for being here. I just have, uh, before we wrap this up, I just have one question I want to direct to Mr. Baker. We are talking about moral hazard. And it seems that the administration and the discussion of H.R. 5818 are concerned about the moral hazard of benefiting the so-called uh, uh, actors and maybe bad faith who uh, would somehow benefit from uh, a bill that would uh, uh, make someone uh, in not whole but repair someone's financial position. Does the concept of a moral hazard seem to apply to Wall Street in this case? <laughs> Well, they obviously have been not concerned about the aspect of moral hazard applying to Wall Street. Um, you know, again, th there's been, I think, fairly explicit on the part of, you know, the Federal Reserve Board and Chairman Bernanke an attempt to, you know, minimize the harm that Wall Street has suffered in this crisis, which arguably has some positive aspects to it. I mean, none of us want to see a financial collapse, you know, so arguably that's a positive aspect. But at the same time, one could easily talk about putting in place um, policies that prevent a financial collapse while at the same time extracting some toll on the bad actors. If the buyer is to beware, is the lender to be prudent? Absolutely. I mean, that's exactly the point here. The lenders are not being asked to suffer. We've stepped in to prevent the lenders from suffering. And again, if the lenders had acted with good sense, we wouldn't have, have, to have half the problem we have today. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dennis Kucinich, Chairman of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee. We're the Subcommittee of Oversight and Government Reform. Uh, today's hearing has been entitled Neighborhoods, the Blameless Victims of the Subprime Mortgage Crisis. This has been one of a series of hearings. This subcommittee examining the uh, impact of the subprime uh, mortgage fiasco uh, on the neighborhoods of our nation. Uh, this subcommittee is going to continue to probe this matter uh, deeply as well as to, as we have had, uh, recommend legislative uh, changes and legislative improvements that will somehow provide some remedy, as some of you have worked on in your respective communities. I want to thank all of the witnesses for their testimony, for uh, their patience today in what has been a very long hearing. And I want to uh, let you know the subcommittee will continue to be in touch with you and your staff as we continue our uh, work to see the um, residential vitality restored to many of our communities. Uh, this committee stands adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. Yesterday's Pentagon briefing, 